how to effectively fight poverty. Paul begins in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, and treat the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. This is familial language that Paul is using. And this will become very important because the direction that he's going to take as he tries to show how to combat poverty really has to do first and foremost with the family and the church. And here he's saying the church is like, like a spiritual family. It says here in verse 3, Honor widows who are widows indeed. Widows indeed. Truly widows. Real widows. In the first century, widows were completely destitute. This was a patriarchal society. This means that, you know, widows couldn't get jobs, they couldn't work, they didn't have any money, any security. And so we see throughout the Old and the New Testament just replete passages that refer to widows, helping the widows, helping the orphans. But, he says here, widows who are widows indeed. But, if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety. The word here is like a word for worship. To worship God means to take care of your family. If any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. The first line of defense against poverty is what? The family, according to the Bible. Now, I want to be very clear at the outset here. We aren't talking about public policy. We're not talking about Democrats and Republicans and progressives and conservatives. That's, that's for school. If you want to take a poli-sci class, you can talk about that there. We're talking about the church. How do you operate in the church? And here he's saying the first defense for each one of our you know, poor members is that they would have a family that could take care of them. Why is this the case? Well, because a family member knows you more than anyone else, more than your friends, more than your church, more than your government. And they, among anyone else, will be able to help you significantly. As I said here, this word for taking care of your family is the word worship. This is literally an act of worship to take care of destitute family members in need. And we see this throughout this entire pericope up until verse 16. In verse 8, we see, If anyone doesn't provide for his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow, that is pretty emphatic language. To reject your elderly family member and just to say, well, I guess you're on your own. That's like, that's like real bad, according to Paul. He says the family must assist widows and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. What if you had a rich family and you had a widow in that family and they just weren't taking care of her and she's going to the church saying, you know, I need help. Don't burden the church. Get the family to get involved. So give aid to widows without families. Now she who is a widow indeed, truly a widow in need of help, and who has been left alone, this means childless, has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. So, our next principle here. Give aid to widows who have remained faithful to God. Now, this is in the church context, right? Now, are we supposed to give money to people that don't know God and don't know Christ? Of course we do. That's throughout the Bible as well. However, the truly destitute females in the first century, no help, no uh, anyone to look out for them, and they're trying to serve God, and we're, and we're going to overlook them. These should be the first people that we take care of. Then he says, but she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Wanton pleasure, the NASB, what does that refer to? A lot of pleasure, but almost like an excessive pleasure. This could be prostitution. 
in this day and age, what do you do if you're a widow? You can't work. You don't have anyone to help you. Prostitution. And Paul says uh, we shouldn't encourage this kind of behavior. Someone who is, is stuck to their convictions, who hasn't done something just to survive, but is trusted in the Lord, hasn't uh, used their sexuality like it's something that's cheap. Um, these are the kind of people that we should take care of here. He says, prescribe these things so that they may be above reproach. Give aid to widows in a way that is above reproach. Unaccusable is the term. Again, as we pointed out in chapter 3, it can't literally mean that there is no one who could possibly make an accusation against you because Jesus was unaccusable, but he was accused all the time. It means that these accusations don't hold any water. They they don't stick. So if somebody said, oh, your financial giving in in your church, oh, it's all screwed up, you could be able to show, not only in in the sight of your members, as Paul puts it, in 2 Corinthians 8.20, but also in the sight of the non-Christian world, in the sight of men, as he puts it, in verse 21. A widow is to be put on the list only If she is not less than 60 years old, I don't know why that's the number, like 59 and a half, you're okay, 60 and three quarters, you're not. Probably a rough figure, but he's like, uh, she's got to be old, is his point. And in this day and age, I know many of you are like 60, that's really old. In this day and age, that would be like 500,000 years old. That would be like really old, like nobody was 60 years old. Nobody lived that long. This would be decrepit at this time. Nobody lived to 60. These are the people that needed the help. So give aid to widows. They couldn't get remarried at age 60. It was pretty rough and rough at that time. And uh, they couldn't work. Who's going to hire a 60-year-old woman? Answer, nobody. So he says, having a good reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, shown hospitality to strangers, Wash the saints' feet. This is a euphemism, of course, not literally washing feet, as many commentators will say. It's in the sense that you're, um, uh, as Jesus did. He said, I give you an example. John chapter 13, an example is something that you're supposed to follow the principle, but not literally the practice. Washing the saints' feet means that these women are those who are serving other people who has assisted those in distress, who has devoted herself to every good work. So, give aid to whom? Give aid to those who love and serve others. We're seeing a list of criteria here. This criterion right here is someone who's a lover and a servant of other people. So this gives them dignity. I remember listening to one of my favorite musicians, and he was saying he was going through... Uh, Austria, and there was a woman out there who was 90 years old sweeping up her shop. This you know, millionaire musician just said, oh man, that poor old woman. His driver said, you Americans, you're all about retirement, living in luxury, golfing, other things. <laughs> in our culture, it gives people purpose to get up in the morning and go and serve at the shop and sweep the floors and be around people and have like a sense of significance. And in your culture, you just, you know, you hit 67 and then uh, you just sit there and want in pleasure and just uh, roll over and turn into one of those characters from that uh, uh, one movie, the, the, the fat people in the chairs. Uh, well, everyone knew it. Over here. <laughs> wow. Lots of Pixar fans. Anyways, loving and serving other people. Yeah. That'd be good. Verse 11, but refuse to put younger widows on the list for when they feel sensual desires in disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous pledge. Oh, you're trying to get money, huh? Uh, And you want to get married. I see. You want to get married. So uh, what you're doing is incurring condemnation on yourself because your husband's dead and you're getting remarried. That's what Paul's saying here. No, 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 no. In verse 14, he specifically says, you should get remarried if you're a widow. I want them to get remarried because they could have a new family, new security. What's he saying here? Two, Two possibilities. It could be that they're telling the church, I need your money. I'm a destitute widow. 
But then they get married on the side, remarried. So they have the financial security coming in, and they got this, the money coming in from the church. So they're what we call double dipping. This is the person who is taking in two salaries. Like a buddy of mine uh, used to go to his job. There's nothing to do there. He would clock in, go to a second job, work there all day, and then go back and clock out. Did I say he was a buddy? Uh, he was a, a friend. No, he was an acquaintance of mine, not a friend. <laughs> I, I knew the guy. That's all, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Terrible guy. He ended up getting fired. It was real bad. Anyways, don't double dip. That's the point. Or this could mean that they, we shouldn't give aid to widows who have rejected Christ. Their previous pledge could be their first love. In the words of John, or really Jesus, in Revelation 2, verse 4, they've left their first love, so they're taking money from the church, and yet they're giving the finger to all these Christians. So they're literally biting the hand, or metaphorically biting the hand that's feeding them. I hate when people use the word literally when it's not literal, so trust me, that's metaphorically. Anyways, you don't care. Verse 13, at the same time, <laughs> they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. Again, we bit, beat, uh, beat this horse to death. Uh, this word busybodies, perirgoi, it means workers of magic. This isn't just old ladies who are telling little fables. This is false teachers. It couldn't be any more clear. We read in verse 14, Therefore, I want younger widows to get married, remarried, widows who are married, have children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for accusation, for some have already turned aside to follow Satan. These busybodies, perirgoi, false teachers, workers of magic, occult practitioners, have turned aside to follow Satan. So that gives us our final principle. Don't give aid to those who are following Satan. That would be a bad idea. No one laughed. All right, well... <laughs> That's what he's saying. That's kind of funny. <laughs> Principles for fighting poverty. What are we seeing here? That was a quick run through this passage. Number one, we can see at least three principles. First of which is this. Families should take care of poor relatives rather than asking the local church to do this. If you have the means, if you have the ability, you should take care of your parents. I don't know what form this is going to take. I was talking to two mature Christian believers who I believe to be in their 60s just in the previous 24 hours. One lives up in Canton, Ohio. One lives here locally. And it's just a coincidence. I'm talking to them studying for this passage. Both of them took in their elderly mother so that they could care for her as she was dying. That is honorable work. That is good work to take care of your parents at the end of life. At the same time, we should consider when we reach this stage, and I know many of us aren't here, most of us, but when we reach this stage, if you have a family of your own, would it be the best idea to move in grandma or grandpa into the house? Or would your, let's say your father, want his daughter to be carrying him to the bathroom to sit on the toilet, to be bathed. Is that what he would prefer? Is that what you would prefer? What I'm saying here is this is very complex. I don't know how we honor father and mother at this stage in the game. The, the point is, don't miss the principle. We need to take care of our parents. We need to take care of the people in our families. We must do it. Number two, local churches should focus their efforts on the truly poor. So, Someone with no family support, verse 5. Someone who is spiritually oriented, but just, just completely poor, abject poverty. Someone who's not living an immoral lifestyle. Someone who's living a sacrificial lifestyle. Good works. And someone who is unable to work. As Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he says, anyone who's not willing to work is not willing to eat. So if you have an able-bodied person who is just refusing to work, trying to take money from other people who are working, that person should not be up there for, for aid. But these, these criteria would be a good set of principles for us, wouldn't they? Giving our money 
to the cause of Christ, to alleviate poverty, to get rid of poverty. It is an absolutely incredible opportunity for impacting others. Sadly, it's a tragic opportunity for immense waste. We read in Robert Lupton's 2011 book, U.S. missions teams who rushed to Honduras to help rebuild homes destroyed by Hurricane Mitch spent on average $30,000 per home to get a bunch of people in the States to go to Honduras to build the home, but they spent thirty k to do that. Homes that the locals themselves could have rebuilt for $3,000 a piece. And if they had done it this way, they could have rebuilt 10 homes and fed into the economy in Honduras. Instead, the laborers there, they're sitting there as all these you know, Western people are coming in. They can't work. All these people are coming in to volunteer to rebuild the home. And they're sitting here saying, I'm out of work. I'm watching other people do work. I could have done myself and probably done better. Lupton says the money spent by one campus ministry to cover the costs of their Central American missions trip to repaint an orphanage would have been enough to hire, catch this, two local painters, two new full-time teachers for that orphanage, and to purchase new uniforms for every student in the school. This is when helping hurts. This is where we're trying to do the altruistic thing. We're trying to go out there and help these people. And so we're rolling paint, and we're doing things like this, and really the local people could do that even better. A principle of any kind of mission's work is that we never want to do work that they could do themselves. We come in there to support the local church, not to supplant the local church. We don't go in there and supplant the work that they're doing, only to support This is staggering. Africa has received $1 trillion in benevolent aid in the last 50 years, yet per capita income is now lower, life expectancy is stagnated, adult literacy is lower, and 85% of the aid never made it over to these African countries. Warlords came together. Remember the earthquake in '80. Everyone bringing in the food, boxes of food. And you saw that the uh, gang leaders and the warlords capturing the food from the charities and then reselling it to the poor people for triple, quadruple the cost. Terrible. We need to be careful. That's why Paul is giving us a list of criteria. You might be saying to yourself, why? Why is he being so uh, specific about uh, the people to whom we're giving money? They've got to be 60. They've got to be people that are moral people, that love God, that aren't going to turn on the people that are giving the money. Why is this so important? Because if we're just throwing money to the breeze, it doesn't do anything. And in fact, it can hurt people. Yes, it can. And uh, we got to be very careful. And we need to be strategic. So we need to meet the physical needs of people. We need to meet the educational needs of people, the medicinal needs of people, and indeed the spiritual needs of people. This is the thing that our world today has completely left out of the picture. In all of these debates that you hear in political science, you know, what is the best utilitarian or pragmatic way to help the poor? They've got great ideas. They've got great studies. The spiritual component is completely missing. But what happens to people when they get their physical needs met, their education, their medicine, and their spiritual needs met as well. Matthew Paris, who is a self-proclaimed atheist, a journalist from the United Kingdom, wrote this article in the Sunday Times. He says in the article, As an atheist, I truly believe Africa needs God. He writes, Now, as a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa. I read that and I said, wait a minute, I misread that. I've become convinced that it hasn't been a con. No, it's, he thinks Christian evangelism, Christians, you know, these evil Christians going into other cultures and sharing about the love and forgiveness and the hope and the significance and the value imparted through Jesus Christ, he actually thinks that's a good thing. 
And this is a man who has traveled. He's a journalist. He's been there. He's seen it himself. He says, sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, and international aid efforts. Yeah, non-governmental organizations, the government. He says, what we see with Christianity, way different. These alone will not do. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. Have you ever heard of Mav Maslow's hierarchy of needs? You can't teach a little kid mathematics if he's starving. So they figured out, we better feed these kids. And they fed them, and then all of a sudden they would teach them, and what do you know? The kids started to do better because they weren't distracted. Or you can't teach a kid English and grammar if he's afraid for his life because he's got eyes in the back of his head. He's, he's wondering if someone's going to beat him up. So if you give him a safe environment, if you give him an environment where his physical needs are met, all of a sudden, boom, spontaneously, he's able to learn. What's Paris's point? That somehow... Christianity is meeting some kind of a need, something for which he can't account, yet he can see it himself. The transformation is real. The rebirth is real. The change is good. Those who want Africa to walk tall amid 21st century global competition must not kid themselves that providing the material means or even the know-how that accompanies what we call development will make the change. A whole belief system must first be supplanted, and I'm afraid it has to be supplanted by another. Removing Christian evangelism from the African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. Do you see his point? To say, well, we're just not going to teach them any beliefs that is incredibly, unbelievably naive. I hope you know that. Everyone has a belief system. You say, I don't have a belief system. That's your belief system. That's called agnosticism. You don't know what the spiritual realm is. If someone is a materialist or a naturalist and they think that they're just a bunch of physical uh, compounds and, and uh, atoms and uh, molecules and juices and chemicals and a, uh, a cerebral cortex and a, uh, some kind of a, neuro, a central nervous system, yeah, Sorry, I'm having a stroke up here. <laughs> uh, but if you think that's what a person is, that's all that they are, um, that's going to affect the way that they live. That when they die, they just become worm food. Yeah. What if you think that everything in the world is infused with spirits? And in order to cure disease, you need to placate these spirits by offering them tribute. You don't think that's going to be a problem for curing poverty? What if you believe that it's okay for men to use women for sex whenever they want? You don't think that's going to be a problem for poverty? His point here is, if we don't give them the worldview that's going to help them flourish, that's going to help them to thrive, some other worldview is going to come in. So the question is not, will people have a worldview? The question is, which worldview will bring love, significance, forgiveness, and a correct view of reality around them. Oh, we need spiritual health. Finally, number three, local churches should hold to a high level of accountability and transparency. These scandals that we see regularly in secular and Christian organizations where the money that's getting taken in never makes it. It's lining people's pockets. It's building up people's bottom line. It never actually goes to where it's claiming to go. We need to have financial transparency. One of the things we do here at this church. We have open books. We have a 95-page report every year that shows you down to the dollar where the money is going from our giving in our church. I mean, it's so long, even I didn't read it, okay? It is painfully long. And, and I know some people are into like the details and stuff, and they love it. And I mean, you can get into every single point of where the money goes. You can find out how much each staff person makes right down to the dollar. 
If you wanted to know how much do you make, how much does she make? Everyone, this is all knowledge that we give away to the people in our church as well as the people outside our church. This is all open. Not overpaying leaders. We shouldn't do that. Paul gets into this at the end of chapter 5. They should be paid, but they shouldn't be overpaid. That'd be a big mistake. Well, we already talked about that a couple weeks ago. And a no-waste ethic. This is where, again, you're, you're giving to the poor, but it's not really helping. I heard the one story of the guy who was a real expert, you know, and he, he was going into this particular village in this people group, and he said, what we need to do here is we need to, uh, you know, build some uh, gardens for tomatoes. And the people there were going... He said, no, no, I have a PhD. I don't think you understand. We need to build some tomato gardens. This is really good for your health. And the people there are going. You know. So finally he says, no, no, okay, here's the money. We're going to build the gardens. And they built all these gardens and gardens and gardens and gardens. And he's saying, oh, these, these poor backward people, they don't get it. Turns out he didn't get it because a month later, they have roaming cow herds that came through and ate up all of his gardens. And the people turned to him and went. <laughs> All of a sudden, he realized, I should have been working with these people, alongside these people, not over the people, and certainly in not a way that's going to be wasteful, needlessly wasteful. Well, in our church, do we have a widow's list? <laughs> well, that's what he's saying here. Get them on the list, or they're off the list. Do we have a widow's list here? I've never seen one. I don't think so. But we do follow the principles in this passage. See, in our day and age, widows have social security. When the husband dies in our culture, the money goes to the wife. In the first century, the, the husband, uh, money went to the uh, firstborn son. So she didn't have access to any of this money. There was no retirement. There was nothing. So she was destitute. And uh, she couldn't work. None of this. You know, so, so, so. The point is, we shouldn't follow the letter of the law. We should follow the spirit of the letter. What are the principles? And yes, we do follow these principles. We think this is very important. Let's look at this. Let's take a little excursus here. You know, if you give to the ministries in this church, how is it that God is going to use your money? Well, for one, He's going to use it at our award-winning ministry in one of the poorest areas in central Ohio, South Linden. This area was targeted by us because we said we want to find the most difficult, poor area of town, and we want to minister to these people. When we first went there back in the early 90s, the people there were just like, what are you doing here? It started as a little Bible study in 1991, uh, one of the guys there was Jim Swearingen. He had hair down to his butt. He was a hippie. And all these people in South London were like, what is this white hippie doing here? You know, what's he doing? <laughs> he started teaching the Bible and he linked up with some other leaders down there. And it just started with a little small group. Today, this ministry has just flourished. We've had, uh, added a new high school to Harambe Christian School. Now we've got a high school that's teaching these kids all the way from age kindergarten all the way up through into college. Yeah, that started this year. We built a Harambe Christian school about 10 years ago. 12. I used to work there. Worked there for five years. First, I was a volunteer. I used to ride my bike into South Linden. Not a good idea, uh, but I used to do it. And then I got a car. I used to get on there and volunteer. And they're like, how about you have a job? And I was like, all right, that's cool. And then I got a job. And they're like, how about you're the manager around here? And I was like, even better. And uh, so I stuck around there for a while. I love the work. I love the kids. I love the families. I love the staff. I had to leave. It bothered me. But um, it, was a, it was a terrific, terrific experience. Here's uh, my buddy, Brandon Grant. He is an old roommate of mine. Uh, I could tell you stories about him of his uh, previous life. Maybe if we're sitting after the teaching with a beer, I could tell you a couple stories, but uh, now it's probably not the right venue. Anyways, uh, he was in my wedding. We became really close. I never would have thought when he walked through the door of our house church to a Bible study, this guy would be leading down there in Harambe and urban concern. 
Never could have planned that. And uh, here's the test scores for Harambe Christian School. I don't know if you can read that there. They come in there right below Worthington. Above Western. Let me just blow that up just because I can't help myself. <laughs> They're coming in above Hilliard, Westerville. They're beating the rich kids. It's awesome. Oh my God, is that awesome. These kids, they're, it's not just that they're, they're blowing the uh, MAT out of the water, the Metropolitan Achievement Test. They're beating the suburban schools. This is an incredible ministry we have here. It won the presidential, and by presidential, I mean like the United States of America has a president. Um, it was the Thousand Points of Light Award. This was uh, the original George Bush uh, Dana Carvey did a great impression of him. Anyways, it won that award, the presidential award. Won the World Vision Mustard Seed Award. Won the Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award. That is just incredible work. Great work. Grace Haven, local to Columbus, taking care and, and providing safety for women who have been sex trafficked in the Columbus area. We support She is Safe. This is the prevention, rescue, and restoration of survivors of sex trafficking worldwide. But not just in Columbus. We also have over in Cambodia, Fountain of Hope. Over there, there was this, there's this woman from the Nether uh, Netherlands. She's uh, as tall as me. I'm six foot two when I'm standing straight and I have high heels on. <laughs> uh, she's this tall woman, single woman, just goes into Cambodia, starts working with these orphans. Years later, there's 182 home churches, 1,800 members, all indigenous leadership. These are all people that were raised up within the community. The Khmer people, these aren't white people, these aren't Westerners, these are the own people who have taken over this ministry. Mercy Medical Center... This is over in Cambodia as well. Last year, they served 17,000 patients. This is in the midst of COVID. Guys, there's nothing there. It's this or there's nothing. And there's a staff. All that staff there are indigenous workers. They also have people that we support that also lead them and train them. They also, even though it's a medical center, people come and get their physical needs met and then all of a sudden, they want to hear about Jesus. Huh, go figure. They've planted 22 house churches. Southeast Asia. we got to be a little bit broad here, but they have a group that's about 3,800 people in this region. So too, in India, we support the India Gospel League. We made a five-year commitment to them. We keep upping it every five years because we just keep seeing the incredible, unbelievable work they're doing. In five years in this commitment, they have seen 170 churches, 76 pastors were trained, 223 youth leaders, and 248 women were trained. And you say, why do you throw the women part in there? That's pretty sexist. No, it's pretty progressive in India to have women that are being lifted up and treated with respect in the training that they deserve. So too in Ethiopia, 2,500 people 104 house churches, this thing, um, there's a man that was uh, trained over here, went over there, and uh, he started to train other people, and the people over there just like to sit out in their houses, open air, so they'd be having these uh, Bible studies and stuff, and uh, people would just walk right in, and be like, they like to sit around and talk. These would go on for two or three hours, 2,500 people, Unbelievable. Côte d'Ivoire, that's French for the Ivory Coast. In 2016, there were 2,000 people in this network. Now, about six years later, there's 11,000 people. That's, that's uh, two and a half times the size of our church, twice as big. Over in Haiti, 51 house churches, 337 people. We've helped them through the massive uh, presidential assassination, earthquakes, um, Poverty, abject poverty. I mean, this is as big as one of our uh, spheres here in our church, this whole movement happening. 
right in this area. And we shouldn't forget Ecuador. Don't forget them. 52 house churches, 11 under people. They're doing, again, this isn't just the spiritual thing. This is holistic ministry. Microfinancing, building houses, serving poor children. You know, we didn't mention the work in Thailand with HIV AIDS. We didn't help mention all the uh, education the schools were doing. Uh, we could go on and on and on. In total, there's about 30,000 people involved in this. And here's the best part. You ready? We didn't start this. We don't control it. We haven't supplanted those churches. We've just come in and said, how can we support you? And so why are we doing this? What's the motive behind it? Because we love Jesus Christ. That's why. What do you get out of it? We want to see people around the world come to know the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That's why. I know this isn't newsworthy because it's good news. You know, the media wouldn't talk about something like this, but uh, we will. We'll talk about it here tonight. <laughs> How much money do we give to the poor as a church? What figure would you think there? I got the figure. $2.47 million in this church. Yeah, I know the media wouldn't cover that. They wouldn't want to talk about that. Like something good going on in the world where you're helping tens of thousands of people across the globe and in the inner city, get an education, get help. Uh, they wouldn't want to talk about that. But something like this, you know what that is? Of all of our giving that we do in this church, that is 26% of our giving. Of all the money that we give that comes into our church, 26% goes out of the church. We give it away to other people so that they can experience the love that we've experienced. Thank you, God. I hope that never changes I hope we continue to be a generous church. Let's wrap up. Poverty is very, very complicated. With each one of these ministries, they're amazing. It's incredible. They've been hard fought, each and every one of them. I've only personally been involved in one of these ministries, and it was a heartache. It was very difficult. Somehow, the Holy Spirit keeps moving forward. It's like, it's like painful to take an inch for Christ, and yet He keeps moving forward to expand His kingdom. In each one of these ministries, God is liberating people from their physical uh, lack of uh, support, medical lack, their educational lack, and indeed their spiritual lack. Poverty of all kinds. Has He liberated you? You say, oh yeah, those people over there, those Africans, you know, Ethiopians. People in Thailand, they need Jesus, yeah. Cambodians, they need Jesus, of course they do. Haitians, yeah, they need Jesus. What about you? Oh, oh well, you know, of course they need it. <laughs> They're animists, you know, they believe that, you know, you got to give tribute to the gods, and if you don't do that, they get angry and they curse you, and, you know, that's, that's so uh, uh, ridiculous. You know, they, of course they need Jesus, it's probably good for them. It's probably true for them, it's good for them. Uh, what about you? You don't know where you're going where you die, when you die. Think about that. You know how terrifying that is? That you could die and then you just cease to exist. That's the best case scenario for you. The worst case scenario is that you had it wrong for eternity. And you're waking up every day, morning after morning, not knowing where you go when you die. You think it's just for people across the globe? You need Jesus Christ to come into your life. Yes, you do. To have the hope, the significance, the security, the love of Jesus Christ, you need Him to come into your life so badly. I'm sure as I'm speaking, you get that sense that you do need Christ in your life. And the good news is, it's very, very simple. I didn't say it was easy. I did not say that. You're going to have to lower your pride and just say, I can't earn it. I just need to accept it. And what you need to do, just like all these people across the globe coming to faith, you just need to do what they do, is just receive the gift of forgiveness. Say, Jesus, whatever you did on the cross there, you paid for my sins. I pray that that would come into my life, come into my heart. I need you. I need you just as much as they are. They do. And if you do that, you can be secure 
And uh, I'm not saying everything in your life starts to go well, but boy, to have the security there, all of a sudden everything else starts to get some uh, real perspective. Yeah. Have you allowed God to lead your life in the area of finances? If you're somebody who is committed to this church and you have not decided that you want to start giving, and I mean financially, to this church, I refuse to apologize to you for, for what I'm about to say. The Bible teaches that you should give money to your local church, that you shouldn't just come to take but just as God wants to take over your life and lead your life and, you know, your relationships and your friendships and your, your family, and you know, he wants to lead in those different areas, he wants to lead in your financial life as well. Yes, he does. And so I would like to put that on your conscience for you to consider prayerfully before God. What is holding me back from giving to the cause of Christ. What is stopping me from doing that? I'm taking a lot, but the Bible teaches that the one who hears from the teacher should share all good things with him. The way we do finances here, it's not like you would give money to me. I know that's not a, a danger at all in your mind that you would want to give me any money, but um, you can give money to our church. It's overseen. You can see where it's going. We have accountability, op open books. None of that should stop you. The only thing that should stop you is um, whether I want to take my spiritual life to the next level. And you should consider that here tonight before the Lord.